This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Hey, aloha, and welcome to Stan the Energy Man. Stan Osterman here from the Hawaii Center for Advanced Transportation Technologies. And uh, it's been a busy month for me. In fact, I have no idea how this year escaped so quickly, but it's just been zipping by. Um, welcome to the first day of fall, at least in the Northern Hemisphere. Supposedly on this very day, the hours at night and the hours at date are equal, at daytime are equal. So you got 12 hours of each, and that only happens like one day a year. So welcome to fall. And it uh, doesn't seem like fall quite yet, but we won't get into the climate change discussion yet. Um, anyway, thanks for being at the show today. I uh, hope you enjoy it. I'd like to start off by um, talking a little bit about what I did Monday and Tuesday of this week. Uh, as part of my travels, I was in New York City. And uh, if we can bring the first slide up, um, I was at the Hydrogen, International Hydrogen Council, which was a two-day meeting. Day one was when a, a whole bunch of the leaders of uh, industry that work with hydrogen met with a whole bunch of international investors to talk about scaling hydrogen uh, up to the next level where it's really making an impact on, uh, on uh, greenhouse gases and reducing greenhouse gases and cleaning up the environment. So it was a, it was a great uh, presentation by all these companies um, to pitch to the investors. And then day two, we met uh, the states and the federal government met with the same council and talked about what the states and federal government can do to help them with their industry and grow their industry in all the states in the U.S. and even internationally. So it was a it was a great weekend for me or a week for me so far. And of course, I came back a little jet lag from New York City, but I, I'm recovering nicely. Alcohol helps, but I didn't drink a whole lot of it. Um, but I'm back back in the saddle. Another exciting thing that's happening with us is um, coming up near the end of the month, or I think the 29th, we're going to do an eat the streets, uh, street grinds kind of thing. And um, we're going to actually have some hydrogen stuff out there to show people. So uh, the next two slides coming up uh, show some of the equipment. This is our uh, light cart by Lux for GTM. It's uh, one of those things you see at a construction site or in an emergency where you can take this cart anywhere, pop it down, and run it for like two days and get um, LED high-powered lights to light up your, uh, your football fields and stuff. And then this is a five kilowatt generator. And uh, both of these things run off hydrogen. And both of them have about a two-day run time. You can just turn them on and run them and com pretty much completely silent. In fact, the traffic going by makes more noise than these things do. Other advantage is the power coming off of this set is really clean signal-wise. So we're trying to show it to Hawaii Five-0 and some of the other um, movie folks so that they can see how clean the power is off of it. And so besides being quiet, it's also great for the environment and a clean signal for their audio guys to, uh, to use in movies and TV sets. So. We're going to be showing that on the 29th. Um, I think it's at Kaka'ako Park. Rachel will give me a heads up, and next week we'll talk about it some more before uh, the event happens. But today we have Carl Campagna from uh, Kamaka Green. And uh, did I screw it up? So, no, okay. it's perfect. So you guys might recognize Carl as uh, one of the former hosts here on uh, Think Tech. And uh, he and I have talked legislative stuff from time to time and political stuff where we sometimes differ a little bit, but so far we're still good friends, I think. <laughs> yeah, and, absolutely. Um, but we're going to talk energy things today and what's been going on. Uh, Carl worked a little bit on some legislation last session. I'd like to talk a little bit about that. And um, maybe you can start off by telling us a little bit about Kamaka Green and what you, what you do. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. I, I appreciate joining the show and uh, definitely appreciate the work that you do. Um, you're doing a lot of really good work and it's important to make sure that we're bringing hydrogen into the picture because uh, it's an important player. We need to have a diverse portfolio. So I uh, appreciate everything. Um, as far as Kamaka Green, what we do is we provide, we're, we're primarily consultants. We provide uh, environmental consulting, uh, planning. Uh, we've got senior planners uh, that can really help with the development of anything. Um, uh, our, our CEO actually was the um, uh, deputy project manager for the Guam military buildup, mm. the EIS for that. Uh, so we have a range of experience on the federal side, uh, state side, and then commercial side, providing, as I mentioned, environmental planning services, uh, project management, construction management, uh, development services throughout, and mm. we just provide a lot of times the, the in-between part so that things don't fall 
mm. down, and, and, and that's one of the important pieces. So, so you helped dispel the rumor that Guam was going to sink if <laughs> <laughs> yes, you remember that, that. if you put too much on one side, it's going to flip over. Um, yes, <laughs> there was a small, I think, a, a, a statement about that, that there isn't a concern. <laughs> it went viral. <laughs> yes, it did. I remember that. I remember that. It's funny. Okay, so it sounds like, uh, tell us a little bit about the legislation that you worked on this session uh, with okay. the state legislature. Sure, sure. Um, it really starts with last year. Um, I, as I get brought into different projects to work on different things, um, most of what I end up working on is energy related, not everything. Uh, last year, I was brought in by a mutual good friend of ours, mm -hmm. uh, Joel Simon Pietri, to work with uh, the UH uh, Applied Research Lab. Uh, we were given the task order uh, through PACOM uh, for the gift pack project to write up and complete the final report mm. uh, for the green uh, initiatives for fuel transition for the Pacific. That's gift pack. Uh, as a result of the work we did and what we were able to complete through that, one of the pieces, is sort, and this was really analyzing and laying out what the supply chain would look like if we were to do a biofuels supply chain here mm -hmm. in Hawaii. That was the premise of it. One of the pieces within there that was needed was friendly local policy to help support and grow this industry uh, and add to the economy as a result. Uh, so as I completed that contract and finished the work there, I started to look at what that would mean and what that might look like. In terms of growing a friendly policy. And grow, and in terms of that policy and how we can begin to bring mm -hmm. that idea uh, to the legislators in, in hopes of achieving that friendly policy. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So uh, what I immediately realized was there's no reason why it could not have been in some ways a mirror to the Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative from mm -hmm. 2008. So I took a look at that and took a look at some resolutions and I wrote the resolution calling for a green fuels initiative. So it's the Hawaii Green Fuels Initiative. And the resolution calls for, based on uh, Governor Ige's desire to double the amount of agriculture uh, in the state, um, making reference to the clean uh, uh, energy initiative, mm -hmm. and going through all of the bullet points that really makes biofuels and other alternative fuels a viable option, mm -hmm. and what it would do for jobs. The resolution is really calling for, uh, really is, is really a jobs resolution, mm -hmm. saying that if we were to advance this, we would really start up a new industry with regards to manufacturing and the manufacturing that goes along with biofuels, as well as increasing our agriculture once again. Okay. So that's the premise of what that okay. resolution was. Yeah, and, and you know, I focus a lot on transportation energy, and we already have the state focused on grid power. Right. Um, but inside the transportation, you know, area, the one place that is, I want to say, untouched and complicated is aviation fuel and fuels that we use other than vehicle transportation. Right. So I can see us electrifying our you know, cars and trucks and things like that and hydrogen. And, right. But when you start looking at aviation, I mean, I grew up in aviation. I did 35 years in the Air Force flying airplanes, and you're not changing that fuel next week. I mean, that's a big thing. But that's where biofuels could come in, because you can blend the Air Force, the Navy. Everybody has already put drop-in fuels in airplanes yes. and proven that it works. Yes. So the real place that biofuels could make an impact in Hawaii is in the aviation sector. And it's important because airplanes come here with as little fuel on board as they need to save fuel. Right. Because if they carry a bunch of fuel they don't need, they're burning more fuel than they need to carry their fuel. Exactly. So they're going to land here with just the reserves that the FAA wants them to have or requires them to have for the weather. But then they have to load fuel on here. Right. Everybody. Right. Japan Airlines, Hawaiian Airlines, it doesn't matter where you come from they're going to put fuel on. Right. So if we had the right mix in ag to produce food and fuels Correct. that could be dropped in, exactly. talk about how those exactly. would work out in jobs. Absolutely. And that actually was uh, another piece of the resolution was calling that together, saying it, it will increase the amount of food production, whether we're using the food byproducts as part of the biofuel uh, conversion and through the biofuel conversion process or, or other currently grown or potentially grown crops that can do the same thing. What you're doing is you're, you're adding jobs into the ag industry. You're adding a significant amount of money and resources uh, to the, for the development of land, mm -hmm. for the infrastructure needed so that we can actually make that happen. So now we're creating jobs and we're bringing infrastructure more out to rural areas, which is another huge piece that a lot of people are missing. So that's a huge plus. Uh, those jobs 
don't, they're, not, they're not low wage jobs either in many cases. We're talking about uh, once you start to get from growing something, but now we've subsidized that a little bit uh, through these tax credits that we might be able to apply, now we're able to really start paying a solid income for people mm -hmm. as that works its way up through the conversion process right into that drop in fuel. And that is the key, is what are we doing and how are we growing that? And as we get through the conversion and refining process, the goal is let's target jet fuels. Because if you target jet fuels, you're gonna hit every other fuel mm -hmm. as you go, as a process. It's just right. you'll inevitably hit them all. And so that, I, I don't, I, it's more than a theory because it has been proven. Biofuels exist. Uh, airlines such as Alaskan Airlines has committed to as much, I think they try to go 100% uh, biofuels at the moment, uh, biofuels or alternative fuels. There are a couple of others who are starting to add on their percentages, increase their percentages of biofuels. Um, but it's not just airline. I agree with you completely, airline. I know that uh, CAFI mm -hmm. is 100% behind this, um, which is the commercial aviation alternative fuels initiative. Um, also the marine industry. Uh, right. And specifically, that comes from the Navy. Sure. That gift pack uh, project that we were working on was very specific to the Great Green Fleet of mm -hmm. the Navy. So it was about getting that fuel into the ships as well. So it really covers a lot of territory with regards mm -hmm. to fuels, marine, uh, air, and ground. Okay. Ultimately. So as far I mean, as far as I'm familiar with biofuels, you have the the um, Pacific Biodiesel model where you basically take oils or seed oils or whatever and you turn those into um, diesel type fuels. Right. But then you also have um, taking waste products, um, putting it in an anaerobic digester, getting methane and then creating liquid fuels off of that. So is, right. there, the, is there kind of a good mix between the two for Hawaii? What would be a good mix? Um, yes and no. And it's not always about methane either. Mm. Again, you're, you're looking for the, methane isn't necessarily the best, <laughs> and I'm not the scientist on this, but um, methane isn't necessarily the best jet fuel. Right. Uh, so what you want, and that has everything to do with a combination of what the crop is that you're using mm -hmm. um, and what the conversion process is right. in order to convert that into that fuel. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really what level of ethanol are you able to create, what level of methane, or how does that work its way into a jet fuel. Mm -hmm. And um, there are five ASTM regulations that are approved uh, for biofuels and trying to hit those is the, is the goal and each of those will accommodate um, everything from a jet fuel down to uh, diesel. Mm -hmm. Was there, were there ever, and I'm asking you this on basically your experience with the legislature because um, you have a, a little bit more depth in that than me, but um, anything where we're working more on like E85, something on a straight alcohol base um, yeah. locally where we're growing it and you know I, I tell people that you know, I have a pickup truck that says flex fuel on it. I had no idea what that meant. I just go put regular gas in it. But right. come to find that I could run my truck on pure alcohol. Yeah. It's, it's meant for E85, it's but for it E85. can even run pure alcohol in yeah. there. I'm, I'm yeah, not yeah. taking vodka and throwing it in there. But, you know, I mean, we have the potential locally, yeah. but you don't have the source. I mean, there's, you can't find an E85 station except maybe on the military bases you might be able to find some. Exactly, exactly. It's, it's tough. So is, is that an opportunity here for the um, ag, ag community? Um, I'll say yes and no, mostly no these days, and I'll get into why. Uh, okay. first, first of all, most vehicles can run on alcohol. It's not necessarily good for your vehicle in the long run. Um, more than anything, it's not good for the fitting, it's not good for the seals right. and so forth. Um, so I wouldn't recommend that to no, anybody. I, I uh, it, uh, <laughs> my, boat, my boats and, and other engines not even designed to run on ethanol. Just, exactly. They're torn up by it. Exactly, exactly. Um, but when it gets to the ethanol, um, yes, the, the Flex and E85 vehicles, they can use ethanol. They're designed to be able to accommodate that. Um, however, as far as locally, the pro the, what we learned, because there was an initiative for a while, mm -hmm. there was an initiative to try to make sure that we were doing an ethanol project here, that we're going to grow it here. That was one of the first steps um, as we were looking at it. The problem with it is the enzyme necessary in order to convert uh -huh. the, the corn, essentially, mm -hmm. into the ethanol had to be exported or imported yeah, yeah. into Hawaii. And the cost of importing that enzyme to do that wiped away all of the potential okay. value of it. Yeah. So a lot of people don't realize that uh, Hawaii actually grows a lot of seed corn yeah. um, for farmers on the mainland because we're isolated, so we don't have disease issues. We can we kind of isolate it from a lot of diseases that provocate, you know, on the CONUS or yeah. other countries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And number two, they get like three or four growing seasons a year instead of one. 
so they can actually produce a lot more corn here. So right. I just thought ethanol might be a really neat option, but it has its limits too, apparently with enzymes. It has its limits, that. and it's really that enzyme because we can't produce that enzyme yeah. here. Okay. Well, we're up, coming up on a break here. We're going to take 60 seconds and talk about some other shows on ThinkTech and be back with Carl in a few seconds. Ted Rawlson here, folks, your host on Where the Drone Leads, our weekly show at noon on Thursdays here on Think Tech, where we talk about drones, anything to do about drones, drones, remotely piloted aircraft, unmanned air crystals, whatever you want to call them, emerging into Hawaii's economy, educational framework, and our public life. We talk about things associated with the use, the misuse, uh, technology, engineering, legislation, with the local experts as well as people from across the country. Please join us noon on Thursdays and catch the latest on what's taking place in the world of drones that might affect you. Hi, I'm Pete McGuinness-Mark, and every Monday at 1 o'clock, I present Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa, where we bring together researchers from across the campus to describe a whole series of scientifically interesting topics of interest both to Hawaii and around the world. So hopefully you can join me 1 o'clock Monday afternoon for Think Tech Hawaii's research in Manila. Hey, welcome back to my lunch hour. Stan, the energy man here on the first day of fall in Hawaii. We can't really tell. It's just like yesterday. But it's a beautiful day in Hawaii outside, so we're looking forward to a good weekend. I'm going to be doing a yard sale, so come by uh, Olaman and, and on the windward side and buy all your stuff at the yard sale for Christmas presents. Anyway, Carl Capanga back here, and we're, uh, we're talking energy stuff. We just finished off with some biofuels. Let's talk a little bit about solar, because I know okay. you've got a solar project in the works, and uh, why don't you talk a little bit about how th things are going there and what you're doing. Sure, uh, that's, in itself, it could be a big topic for a lot of reasons, depending upon where you want to go. Um, but yes, I actually just completed um, a contract where I was uh, working with a company uh, helping them finish off uh, the construction side of the development phase, as well as, which feeds into, but as well as the permitting side. Uh, they were trying to get permitted seven megawatts total wow. of PV. So uh, it was all commercial, um, 500 kW to a megawatt uh, size farms, and um, a total of 12 of them is what they were looking at doing. So um, I get brought in to help them go through the process. So I, now, I, I assess and analyze where they are and what they need. Um, and there are things that get in the way that not everybody understands how to read, let alone address. Um, and that includes if you've got conditional use permits uh, and requirements or supplemental use permits and the requirements thereof. And those can often get in the way. And that's going to be part of the conversation we'll have later as well. But that's where we, as we jump in and try to assess those things and figure out how we resolve each of those hurdles, then you get to the point where then now you, your permit gets to be um, awarded to you and then you get to go build it. So that's what uh, we uh, were brought in to do, to help bring them through those phases to get those permits. Mm -hmm. We were able to get 10 of the 12 permits. The two we did not get were because there were, there were more finance side development that had not been completed. So those had been postponed. So, okay. But that's, that's the projects that we were working on. So the uh, ten, 10 of the 12 projects were on Oahu, two of them, uh, which was equal to a little over two megawatts, was actually on Maui. Okay. Well, I know that we have a lot going on on Oahu, and there's a general observation. A lot of the electric demand is on Oahu and a lot of the renewable resources are on neighbor islands. Yeah. And the question is, how do you get it back and forth? And we've talked undersea cables and, yeah. you know, turning it into fuels and shipping fuels or however you want to do it. Right. But um, we cover the gamut in terms of permits, you know, and, and you hit on it. It's, it's use permits, it's building permits, it's county, it's state, it's federal, it's regulations, it's FAA, it's EPA. It's, right. There are so many pieces, and depending on exactly what you're doing, I mean, if it's agriculture related, you may even have health department or ag regs that come in. And you will. So uh, if, you, if it's a flood zone, you have to make sure that you're addressing and accommodating exactly. that accordingly. Sometimes you have to build what you're doing up six feet to accommodate the flood zone. It's understanding right. that, yeah. So is there is there any, like, I mean, it's probably your, your core employment uh, security, but is there any one-stop shop that you go in and say, I'm starting a new business in, you know, making hydrogen and, you know, help me get my permits and, and you go in and you get a checklist of who to talk to at the federal building and city hall and everybody and 
and you just smooth right through and in two weeks you got your permits and you're off and running? Um, in two weeks? Yeah. No. no. <laughs> um, but why? There, there's no shortcut um, okay. for a lot of for a lot of reasons. You don't want shortcuts for one thing well, true. because you need to make sure that things are being looked at correctly. Mm -hmm. The only way you would want a shortcut is if you've got if if you have parameters set up. Uh, prerequisites that are set up that you have already confirmed that sure. you have abided by. And if you can do something along those lines and say, okay, we've already completed all of these pre-requirements, mm -hmm. which means here we've submitted this for your final review, and as long as you know what that is supposed to look like, you know what your drawing sets are supposed to look like, what's supposed to be included, you've already collaborated with all of the utilities necessary to make sure that everyone is in agreement on what you're doing and how you're doing it. If you go through each of those steps, and then, you know, but it doesn't all exist that way now. Mm -hmm. um, to answer your first question, is there a one-stop shop? There are a few different companies out there that that are really good, that know what's needed. And that's needed. their job? That that is their job. They are permitting expediters, and they are really good at it. They probably don't want me to mention who they are. And they uh, have connections with Monopua and Malasadas and... Absolutely, okay. they do. Uh, absolutely, and, and actually you get more ingratiated with them when you bring them to them, <laughs> uh, certainly. Uh, but uh, no, there are a few companies out there. There's a lot of companies that will say that, hey, they are permitting, permit expediters. Some of them are better than others. So knowing who and where to go and based on what the project type is, mm -hmm. is important. Um, so what are the, some of the longest lead like if, you, if you're starting a, a fairly large environmental project or an energy, like a solar project, mm -hmm. a, a commercial grade, industrial grade solar project or something like that, what are some of the long term, you've got, it takes a long time to get through, like an EPA assessment? If you're going through an EIS, uh, in most cases, see, what, what, what most developers try to do is skip as much as possible right. because it costs money. Mm -hmm. um, but as most of us here in Hawaii know, there's something called the super ferry effect. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you don't want to get super ferried. No. Um, so you don't want to skip those. Uh, so my company and several others are, are similar. Are, are, we are one of the companies that says, okay, no. Uh, if you don't want to go through and do each step that you were supposed to do appropriately and pay the small amount, relatively speaking, up front to make sure that everything has been done so that you have checked all of those boxes, if you don't want to do that, then I, I'm not your contractor, mm -hmm. I'm not your consultant, I cannot help you. Uh, because I have a problem with someone who tries to cheat the system, someone who tries to get around all of their requirements. Mm -hmm. That doesn't work for me because the super ferry happens because reputations are built and destroyed based on what you say you can do. Mm -hmm. And if I were to come in and say, well, I think you should get all of these studies and all of these reports done, and they say, well, I don't want to do all those, I say, well, okay, I'll do all of this for you without doing all of those things, and then I don't get it done because I didn't do this, or something mm -hmm. comes gets kicked back, and the project that just spent millions of dollars anyway, and now they can't build it. Right. You don't want that scenario, and all that does is create more friction with all of the agencies and departments, including the Department of Planning and Permitting. Mm -hmm. You don't want those relationships. Is there a so. correlation between the super ferry effect and the 30 meter telescope effect? Are they different or similar? Different. Or? I think they're different. Um, I think they're different in that the super ferry effect is they, they didn't do the EIS, mm -hmm. or certainly not all facets of the EIS that they were supposed to do. And because they were told, don't worry about it, we got it covered. Mm. Well, that was somebody thinking that they had a political end, that they can pull this and be done. Mm. Well, the problem with that was, as soon as a couple people decided they didn't like it, they that was their looked angle. at it and they found the angle that got in there to give mm. the leverage to shoehorn it out. Mm. Didn't they mm. use the Army's fast trimaran ship that runs around and does similar speeds and similar routes as a, as a as hey, we already do it, it's already out there, it's already running. Yeah, I think they use that, but that doesn't... It doesn't do it. You can't use their EIS. Okay. Or whether or not they got an EIS, is, I, I can't okay. speak to that. But no, you can't true. use their EIS. You have to have your own mm. uh, study. Now, you might, be able to, you might be able to if you look into some, and depending on how old they are, because all of these studies, whether they're archaeological studies or environmental studies, whether it's uh, what's called the bugs and bunnies, whether you're looking you know, mm. or, or plants, all of these studies have, uh, they go stale after a period of time. Going okay, stale, going stale means they, they, they don't apply anymore. They have a shelf life. Exactly. Yeah, okay. So depending upon when that was done and if it was done, and if it included and encompassed the area that you are planning on okay. affecting, yeah, that's whether or not you can 
lean on that one. So do you, as a general rule, do you start off with an environmental like study and then do an assessment? I mean, which one's the longer? One of them's longer than the other. Yes. And, and uh, in environmental, there's an environmental assessment and then there's an environmental impact statement. statement right? The environmental assessment is the short version. And is it normal to do that first, or unless you know you've got to do a whole? It depends on the project. Okay. Uh, yes, it depends on w what the project is, the size of the project, and the total area uh, that you are impacting, mm -hmm. and what is impacted by that area as well. So, uh, for example, if, you, uh, if you're going to go and put a, uh, um, a, a relatively small PV farm, on a, on a plot of land that has already been determined is industrial and is 55 feet above sea level and uh, go, start going through all of these little checkoff bullet points. And you hit all of those parameters and say, okay, well, there's no reason for us to have any trouble with this. You can go through and do your basic assessments and have your environmental assessment indicate, by the way, we are 55 feet above sea level, we are more than 500 feet from shoreline, um, and all of these other requirements that come into place. We do not have a CUP requirement for, uh, for anything, including uh, state historic preservation. Mm -hmm. You start going through those lists and realize, okay, this project, it, you just need a little state basically thing. helping them evaluate your project. Exactly. And when you've done saying you, there's no reason that anything else has to be done and you have an official mm -hmm. person who is either certified or, or uh, their profession is doing these assessments, mm -hmm. provides that report, and you provide that report to all of the entities that need to see it. As you submit it for your permit, they go, yeah, okay, I, we agree with you. We've done that assessment. Mm -hmm. We agree with you. You're good. Okay. Nine times out of ten, that's not true. Nine times out of ten, you're going to have a flood zone you have to deal with. You're too close to the shoreline. You've got a flood you've zone got a issue. issue. You've, you've got, got a runoff thing. issues. Um, you've got transportation concerns. Mm. Maybe your project actually isn't anywhere near an access point from the highway. Uh, so how do you do that? Um, you're crossing over somebody's, um, someone else's uh, property or yeah, easement, yeah. and you've got utility easements, three or four different levels of easements to deal with sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, and all of that stuff needs to be understood. Mm -hmm. And you need someone who knows how to, number one, understand it, and then how to address it. Mm -hmm. So well, as a, and I'm a contractor too from the old days. That's why I said two weeks is fine. Because <laughs> we can actually get a building permit in a couple of days sometimes. But uh, on simple projects. But yeah. <clears throat> we used to use rules of thumbs a lot, yeah. rules of thumb. So we go like so much a square foot, you can build a building or so much. Yeah. Okay, nowadays with all the permitting, is there like a percentage of the project cost that you just figure you're going to sink 8% into of someone to, to help you facilitate your permits and do all that work? Yeah, um, let me say you should. You should. Yeah. Um, and if you contact the right people, the right companies mm -hmm. that know these concerns and knows the territory as well, knows the land, then yes, they can begin to put a little package together for you. Say, okay, this is going to cost you fifty thousand dollars to get all of your studies done. Mm -hmm. And then, so what is the size of your overall project? How does that fit into your budget? Mm -hmm. You should do that. What I have unfortunately come across more times than not is that non-local developer that doesn't care, that non-local developer that doesn't understand what it costs to do the work here, that doesn't understand how the system works here, thinks that they can bully their way through uh, the process. I don't need to do this because of this. Oh, I've never had to do that before over here. I've never had to do that. That only causes more trouble. So yeah. again, I choose to not take most right. of those contracts. So, so I guess my question is, if you were coming in brand new and trying to do an environmental project or energy or solar project, how much should I roughly budget for? And if my total project's a million bucks or two million bucks, like what kind of percentage is it? Is it like a big percent or no, something under small, ten? Or it's a small percent, way under ten. I, but I just have to account for it. It's it's a it's a percentage point at at, at best okay. uh, for most of that. And it's worth the investment. More than worth the investment okay. uh, because once you've done it then you have nothing else getting in your way. You have okay. no other stumbles uh, okay. getting in your way. Well, believe it or not, we've pretty much bumped up against 30 minutes here with oh. Carl, and uh, it's, it's always great to talk to you, Carl, and thanks for your insight. Um, Thank you. Especially on the permitting piece. Uh, that's, that's a big boogaboo for a lot of folks that are trying to start off in business, and the permitting's a big issue, so thanks for some insight on that. Thank you. Thanks for joining us uh, today on Stanton Energy Man. Thanks to Cindy and Robert here in the control room doing all their good stuff and making the cameras work and making me look skinny and everything and uh, appreciate it. See you next week on Stand Energy Man, aloha.